actual lecture and YouTube is starting now. Okay. So what we'll do today is to uh, take a look at three programs. The first one is what is due at 9 a.m. So we are going to talk about the swap subroutine. And then what we'll do is I will introduce two independent programs. And each independent program is a clue to the lab that you're going to do over the weekend. And this one in some way is easier compared to the swap subroutine. In some other ways, it is a little bit more complicated. So we'll take a look at that too. So there are three programs for me to go through. And um, if you have questions, you know, it's a go ahead and ask your know, questions. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. I just need to go find the right terminal. And I think I have to go th cycle through all of my stuff until I get to it. Nope, that's not it. Huh. Oh, okay, I see it. Right there. Okay. All right, so first thing first, we'll deal with the swap subroutine. And the swap subroutine has a main um, in the lab already. So you can actually use that main and only implement the swap subroutine to so that you can test whether your swap subroutine is working or not. So let me do that. Okay, let me go back to the assignment or the lab. Not this one. This is an old, much older one. Well, not much older, but I think it's, that's the previous one. So we'll get back to the swap subroutine, which is, I think it is stack operations. Nope, it's function call. There we go. All right. And I'm just going to do an edit because that's just, you know, that's faster for me to find the code that I need to copy and paste. So as you move down here, okay, you know, it explains you know, all kinds of stuff about subroutines. Um, and then eventually you find the swap subroutine, which is written in C. And then we have the main that is corresponding to that. So we'll go ahead and copy and paste this code. And then we'll continue from that. So control C, switch back to my command line here. We'll call this swap.ttpasm. And here is paste. There we go. Control D to stop this. So now we can actually go in and um, you know, finish the coding. Uh, the other thing that I would probably do is to uh, also copy and paste the C code. So this way you can look at the code um, side by side, especially for the swap subroutine. So we'll do that too. So here's a new control C. And this is swap.c. And paste it. There we go. All right. So now we can display these two side by side. So we got swap.c and swap.ttpsm. All right. So main is really not um, that exciting. Um, it does do the allocation. And the way the allocation is done, you know, is a little bit different. Because in this case, um, x is um, the low is the one with a lower address and y is the one with a higher address. But as I said in previous in the lecture of yesterday, there's really no requirement you know, for uh, local variables to op to be ordered in a specific way. So they can be ordered in any way as long as they are used consistently. So that's why in main, you know, as long as I you know do this consistently, because the idea is the the, the values of x and y should be exchanged when the subroutine is done. So which one I call x and which one I call y is really not that important. Unless you want to correspond the value of 3 for initialization to be x and the 7 to be y. So in this case, you know, x is the one that has the higher address, which is at location ff, and x is the one that has an address that is one byte below that of y, which is at location fe. 
So the key is, by the time you get to the subroutine in swap, you probably want to at least take a look at what is on the stack, um, what parameters are being pushed on the stack. There should be two pointers, PTR1 and PTR2. And then the other thing, um, I hope nobody you know exploited this one, um, is in swap, there's no visibility of what stuff is in main. In other words, in swap, you know, people cannot just say, well, I know that, you know, uh, Y is at location FF and X is at location FE, and I'm going to use that to finish, you know, the swap subroutine. That would not meet the requirement because the idea is we look at the C code of swap and we need to translate that C code into assembly code. So that means, you know, we're, I'm not only looking at the effect of the program. I'm also looking at how the assembly code of swap is corresponding to the uh, the C code of swap. That is kind of more important. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing is I want to know what the stack looks like. So PTR2 is the first one being pushed. So it has the highest address within this frame. PTR1 is the second one to be pushed. And then we have the return address pushed. Um, and then we need to have our own local variable t uh, to be reserved. So initially, when we get when we are at the entry point of the subroutine, the stack pointer is only pointing to the return address because that's all that the caller can set up. The caller cannot know how many or um, how many bytes the local variables of a subroutine needs. So we still need to allocate um, storage on the stack for local variable t. So the first thing we do, now it also depends on how elaborate you want to make this code. Um, so the typical way that I do it is um, I want T to be um, what the stack point is pointing to. And then I want to look at the size of swap or how many bytes are used for local variables. So we have swap local var size being T1 plus. So this reference to t is because t is quote unquote the last local variable that I allocate. And then the one is the size of the uh, variable t. And then plus basically means, okay, you know, we are just counting, including um, variable t, how many bytes are we using on this, on this particular frame for local variables. Um, then we can skip uh, return address because there's really no need to uh, access return address while we are still in the body of the subroutine. We only need to get back to the return address at the very end after we deallocate t. So we don't need that. Uh, PTR1 is defined to be uh, swap local var size 1 plus <clears throat> and that one here, okay, this particular one is to account for the return address because the uh, return address is taking up one byte so that's why we need to add one to the number of bytes used by local variables that is where we can find ptr1 compared to where the stack pointer points to and ptr2 is ptr1 1 plus because it is just one byte beyond that and once the labels are defined i can just use the generic entry code and the exit code to allocate for local variables and to deallocate the local variables. So we have LDIB um, swap local var, uh, var size and to allocate we subtract. We subtract this much from the stack pointer and then to deallocate we are going to add oops there we go. So for deallocating we are adding and after that, we have a normal return to whatever the caller, wherever the caller needs me to go back to. So we have a LD BD increment D JMPB. So this is kind of the shell of just about any subroutine. Okay, if you have a subroutine where you have no local variables, it still works. Okay, as long as you define your local var size to be zero, this code still works. Okay, it's not a problem. Um, if you have a return value, this code for returning still works because the return value is specified in register A and I'm using register B, you know, after the end of the actual body of the subroutine. So it won't interfere with a return value either. So this is a nice kind of you know, shell for any subroutine. 
So now I can start to implement the actual, you know, subroutine. So I'm going to do this relatively quickly because, you know, most of this stuff we have, I, I have already explained in, uh, in yesterday's lecture. So today I'm just really doing this, you know, rather quickly without a whole lot of explanations. Okay. And All right, so these instructions here is implementing the first statement in swap. It is taking whatever PTR1 is pointing to and store that to local variable T. And then we move on to the second line. Okay, so, and you can see that, you know, the second line is not going to be that much different. Um, there's a lot of repetition in terms of what we're doing because the, the template is really about the same. We still have the dereference PTR2 this time. And where we want to store that is not to overwrite PTR1, but to overwrite what PTR1 is pointing to. So we have kind of the same deal, except this time we have an extra load. Um, then we have the store. Because we are not overwriting the parameter, we are overwriting what the parameter is pointing to. And then we have the third statement, which is um, closer to the first one, you know, because we only have to dereference twice on one side, but not the other side. So we got this, we got that. Then we can work on the, uh, the left hand side. So we got this. And then we got that. And that should do it. Okay, you know, um, you can see that, you know, th there are certain templates. Um, these three lines, you know, almost always, you know, are together. Okay, you load the offset into a register using LDI, you add the stack pointer to the offset, that will calculate the actual address of something that is on the frame. And then we do an indirect access to either overwrite that location or to read from that location because you know the value is what we want in this case. So are there any questions about the implementation of the swap uh, subroutine because that's basically what I just did. Or you know, I should I, sh I should qualify that. That's what I think I just did because we haven't tested it yet. So the next step is to test it. But before I go you know, to test the program, do we have any questions about the implementation? And let me turn on line numbers just so that people can you know, refer to a specific line if they want to ask questions. Mm -hmm. No questions. All right. Okay. So if there are no questions, I'm going to insert a new note up here at the very beginning, um, which is really just here because I want to run this program through um, the CLI mode of um, the of Logisim. Now this program doesn't have to be debugged through the CLI, but if I made a mistake, the CLI mode is going to be uh, a lot more friendly if I want to debug the program. And in a certain way, I'm actually hoping this program doesn't work because one thing that I do want to teach in all of my classes is how do you debug a program, okay? Um, so if the program doesn't work, that will give me the opportunity to um, basically talk a little bit about how to debug a program. So we'll see, we'll see whether it works or not. Okay, so we save the program. And we do the usual thing, which is uh, putting this into the clipboard. Like so then we go back to the assembler. Okay, go to the source tab, delete whatever is in column A of the source tab, and then just paste the program in the way it is. All right, so we got some questions coming. Excellent. All 
All right, so the question is, in the instructions yesterday, I mentioned logging specific RAM locations. Can I do that as a specific category using the trace analyzer in the CLI, or do I just look down the RAM right column? Yeah, you just look down the right uh, the RAM right column. The lab instruction you know, does not mention about um, using the trace analyzer because the lab was created before I got the trace analyzer working. So, um, so it was not, uh, it did not include instructions to make use of the trace analyzer. Okay, cool, no problem. All right, so now we need to run the program. And I, as I said a little bit earlier, now that we have introduced the trace analyzer, we'll go ahead and run it inside the trace analyzer. So we'll go to the temp folder and I am just going to be a little bit lazy, you know, by looking at some of the previous commands already and just copy and paste the command. Um, I don't want to copy and paste the entire thing. I don't need the line feed. There we go. So this is swap and swap instead of the ABS program. There we go. Everything seems to look good. Press the enter key. Uh oh. Oh, right, because I need to specify where to find that. There we go. All right, so the program just ran. You know, I collected the trace. So now we need to go back to the trace and see how we can verify whether the program works or not. So switch back to the browser and go to the trace analyzer and then do the usual stuff importing the TSV file Right, click import. So the first thing we need to do is to think about now now that we are looking at the trace analyzer, how do we know whether the program worked or not? Okay, so that's one question. So to answer that question, we first have to know, you know, what is being stored to local variables x and y and where they are so that we can tell you know, what content is supposed to be exchanged if the program was working correctly. Okay, so that's the first thing we need to do. So we know that location FF and location FE, those two are local variables Y and X respectively in main. So we are just looking down, you know, um, column C in this case, and see what locations are being modified. So the first location that got modified was uh, FE, so this is our X in main, and then the next one is FF, which is our Y in main. So if the program worked correctly, then when the program is all done, then the location FF should have the original value in location FE, and the value of location FE should get the original value of FF. In other words, we should end up with FE having the content of 07 and FF having the content of 03. So if you're impatient, you can always kind of skip all the way to the end and see if that is true. So we can see location FF, you finally got the value of 03. You know, I must be clicking, double clicking something and that's why it, you know, it warns me that I'm not supposed to be editing. And then you, we can also see how location FE is getting the content of 07. So the program did work correctly, you know, inside swap, but we also have to make sure that the swap subroutine uh, returns to main correctly and the stack pointer is balanced when we are done with everything. So we keep scrolling like this and we're looking at the uh, stack pointer. So right before the halt instruction at location 1B, the stack pointer did go back to 00, zero so the stack is balanced. So if I just look at the um, these few things, um, the program you know seemed to be working correctly. 
and that's it. So do we have any questions about the swap subroutine? And if people are having you know challenges writing this code, you can kind of let me know you know what the challenges are. You know, in, uh, you can use direct messaging if you want to, um, because you know that's how I can cater um, you know future lectures. You know, in even within the summer session, to see if I can help clarify some of those concepts that are actually you know that I think should be used for this particular lab. No questions, no comments, no direct messages whatsoever. Okay, all right. So if there's if there are no questions about this, then we're going to move on. And I have two programs that I want to demonstrate today. Both are related to the lab that you need to do over the weekend, and you kind of have to figure out how they are related. Okay, so that's 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 something that you have to make connections. What I'll do is I am going to present and explain these two programs. The first one I'll just say you know power of two, so we will have the C version and then we'll have the TTP ASM version. Oops, um, I need to do a dash uppercase O to display these side by side. So this is the C version, which is going to be uh, compilable and I can run it in uh, GDB. So in this case we have uint8 underscore t. Um, I specifically choose this type just so that um, the C code is going to be consistent with the assembly code. Um, we have p2 as a subroutine which is power of 2. It has one single argument which is n. And this subroutine is supposed to return 2 to the power of n. Okay. It's not too difficult okay, because we can do all the you know, left shift operations. We can also use a loop and keep multiplying by 2 until uh, we have multiplied 1 by 2 n times. Okay. We can do all of these, okay. but I'm going to choose to do this in a recursive way. Okay. So if you're having um, challenges you know, when you're trying to understand recursive subroutines, this is the one example that will help you understand what is going on with recursion and why it works. Okay, so this is kind of a rather important thing. So what I'll do is I can I can do this with a single line. Okay, I can use a single line of return statement because I can use the ternary operator to see whether n is um, greater than zero. Okay, so I can say if n is greater than zero, then we will we'll return um, two times. Um, let's see, let me think, 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 think. Okay, we'll shift the result by one. Okay, so that's what we'll do. So we'll say let's call p2 again, but this time with n minus one as the parameter. But then after this is all done, we'll left shift by one like that. And this is supposed to be the question mark because the colon is here. So the co so the stuff after the colon is what if n equals to zero? So people may ask, well just because n is not greater than zero doesn't mean that it is zero. In general that is not the case because there are a lot of negative integer values that are less than zero. But in this case, because n is an unsigned 8-bit integer, if it is not greater than 0, guess what? It has to be 0. So now we are talking about 2 to the power of 0, which is 1. So that in that particular case, we, are not we don't need recursion because we already know what the answer is. So are we doing okay so far with the recursive definition of power of 2 and why it works? The left shift by one is basically saying multi multiplication uh, by two, so it's kind of the same thing. Mm. So why are we doing that? Can you clarify what that is referring to?
um, because the power of two can be defined recursively. If you want to, um, so instead of shifting this by n, okay, you know, just you know, say one left shift n times, um, we are just you know doing it by one. So you can also kind of imagine that we are multiplying by two. Because left shift by one is really the same thing as multiplication by two. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it returns the power. It returns two to the power of n. Splitting into two parts. Are we talking about the then part versus the else part? Or the recursive part versus what we have to do after the recursion is has uh, after the recursive call is has returned. Why not just return to the power of n? Because the whole idea is, I just want to use this as an illustration of recursion. Yep. Okay. Not a problem. All right. So. Uh, all right. So let's go ahead and you know do the main here. Um, U in eight underscore t. Just give me a local variable x, and we just want to find uh, two to the power of let's say three. Okay. So we just want to see this, and that's all we're going to do. Okay. So now we go to the assembly side, and then we say, okay, how do we do this in assembly? So we start with a no op here, you know, just because um, we might we probably want to run this in CLI mode, so I can use a trace analyzer to find out what is really going on. Um, and then we have a JMPI to main. And before that, okay, somebody asked me this yesterday, because sometimes I have you know the extra load uh, D with zero, and other times I don't do that. It's because you know this is really optional. Um, every time we run the simulator, all the registers you know default back to uh, a value of zero. So there's really no need to explicitly uh, load zero into register D. Um, but you know it's good to have it here to just to remind ourselves you know how the stack pointer is initialized. Um, so that's really kind of for documentation purposes more than anything else. So in main, you know, I have a local variable x. So x is the only thing on the stack in main's frame, as far as we are concerned. So you know, if we want to go through all the trouble to do this, you know, I suppose we can. So x has an offset of zero from where the stack pointer points to, uh, when main has set up everything, um, and also the num the number of bytes used by local variables of main. Is just one because you know there's only one single byte, and it is just x1 plus. And so when we allocate that space, remember we have to do the allocation. We do the same thing, you know, LDIB with main local var size, uh, subtract that much from the stack pointer, and when we are all done, we have to deallocate my local variable, so it would just be an add instead of subtract. So you can see how you know this code here. Okay, let me highlight which part I'm talking about. How this part, you know, this is kind of like a um, a universal template for all subroutines. Um, tell me how many bytes we're using for local variables, and then we'll do the allocation before we do any coding, and then we'll do the deallocation after the actual body of the subroutine. So in main, uh, we have to call uh, p2 with a with an argument of three, so that's pretty easy to do. Okay, so we document the um, stda. That's that pushes three on the stack. Then we have to push the return address on the stack. So this is where I will kind of uh, introduce you to a different way to do this. So we'll document d first, okay? Because there's no uh, there's no Advantages or disadvantages, whether we want to uh, perform the LDIA in this case or decrement D first, because we need both to be done before we can do the store, 
And these two do not have any in interdependencies. So it doesn't really matter which one we do first. So this time we'll decorate in D first. But when we uh, load A with the return address, we'll start to do something that is kind of interesting, which is a dot five plus. Now I'll get back to explain this. So don't worry, I'll come back and explain this. Um, and then we will do the ST instruction, STDA, like so, JMPI to the subroutine, which is called P2. And when it gets back, you know, we are going to deallocate the argument, which is three that is still sitting on the stack. So that's a single increment D. And register A has the result. So we need to store register A to local variable X in this case. So we uh, do the usual thing. Okay, so we LDI uh, B with the offset to X. And then we add the stack pointer to B, which is the offset. So now B is the actual address of X. And then we do STBA because A is the return value from calling P2. And that should accomplish everything from the perspective of main. Now, let's go back to this kind of dot five plus notation. So the one thing that is new to us is dot, okay? What is that dot doing in a postfix uh, expression? So what the dot really is, is it is representing the address of the instruction that the dot is appearing in. So in this case, it is the address of the LD, LDI instruction. So it's basically saying, get the LDI instruction's own address and then add five to it. And that is the constant that we want to store in register A. So now the question is, why five? So now let's do some counting, okay? So offset zero and one belong to the LDI instruction because any LDI instruction takes up two bytes. Offset two, belongs to the ST instruction because the ST instruction only takes up one byte. The JMP instruction also takes up two bytes, so that would use up offset three and four. So the instruct the increment D instruction, which is what we want to do after the subroutine is done and return to main, is at offset five. Oh, okay. This is why we have a dot five plus. This five has to do with the increment D instruction is exactly five bytes from the address of the LDI instruction itself. So the, the, the reason why sometimes, you know, or most of the time I want to do it this way instead of using a label is one, this makes sure that I do not need to define an extra label just to specify where to continue execution when the subroutine is done. But the more important part is I won't make the mistake of using the wrong label because there's, there are no labels involved in this case. So we got a question coming, but then you can't add any lines of code in between. Hmm. In between what? Let me turn on line numbers here. I'm guessing between line 18 and line 21. Yes. Yep, that is correct. So the sequence has to be done exactly like that. So line 17 to line 20 has to be done exactly the way it is shown here. That is correct. But, th but that's really just pushing um, the return address and doing the unconditional branch to the subroutine there really should not be any need to insert any lines of code from you know, between line 17 and line 20. Now line 21 is after the return. So line 21 is whatever the caller needs to do after the subroutine has returned. So maybe there's some stuff to clean up on the stack. Maybe there's nothing to clean up on the stack depending on whether there are arguments pushed already. So that's kind of not within that particular sequence. The sequence is are really just these four lines. And the next one. Oops. Ah, okay. I need to highlight the correct lines. So, so line 17 all the way to line 20, these four lines will basically have to stick together 
if we are to use the notation of dot five plus to specify the return address. So is are we doing okay so far with this? All right. Okay, cool. Now, when we look at this from the assembler's perspective, we'll actually get to see that it will compute the correct address. So now let's go to the fun part of this. The fun part of this is the implementation of P2. So P2 is a subroutine that has one argument. So we first look at what is on the stack. So we got N pushed by the caller. We got the return address also pushed by the caller. There are no local variables in this case. So there are, you know, we just basically say um, P2 local var size is zero. Okay. Now, if you're one of those people, you know, who say, okay, if I get a template that works in all cases, I'm just going to stick that template into the code, but whether it's needed or not. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice some efficiency just to make my code easy to write. Okay. Because I can just do a copy, paste and modify in this case. If you're one of those people, well, guess what? We can now do it. So we just copy and paste this code here. Now we do have to modify because we are not in main anymore. Oops, uh, I got too much out. So we say P2 over here. This is how we allocate for the local variables. And this is how we deallocate the local variables. And somebody's going to say, but we don't have any local variables. Well, that's okay because P2 underscore local underscore var underscore size is just zero. It doesn't do a single thing to the stack pointer either way, but that's okay because, you know, this is the quote unquote template. Okay. So the nice thing about the template idea is it always works. Okay. As long as you calculate and define the local variable size, um, this is going to work. So we're going to do the usual stuff too over here. This is also part of the template. Uh, get the return address, deallocate um, the byte on the stack that was used to store the return address and then continue execution in the subroutine. So even this part is part of the template. So now we just have to worry about what goes in the inside of this thing. First thing we need to do is to figure out whether n is greater than zero or not. Okay, so let's try to figure that out. Okay, there's a really nice little shortcut to do this. But no shortcut can be done unless we get to the value of n first. Okay, so we have the usual template again to access the value of something that is in the frame of an invocation of a subroutine. So we do all this stuff here. So register A is now the address of n, which is not really what I want. I want the value. So we do LDAA. So now register A is really n. So now we do that trick that we have seen before and AA. So all this does is to force the value of force the, the bit pattern of register A through the ALU and influence the flex register. But this time we are not looking for something that is negative. This time we want to see if it is zero. So we use JZI right after the and AA instruction to tell us, well, if A is zero, where do we want to go? It is the else case of um, the subroutine. So we just have to define a label for P to else. Okay. So if we continue execution over, he over here, and this is what I usually do is I would say, if I continue execution you know, and not do the branch, that means N is greater than zero. If not, N is zero over here. So this way, you know, w with these labels, I can later on remember what to do at P2 underscore else. Now, because this is a if then else, I also need an unconditional branch to the end if. In, in other words, when the conditional statement, or in this case, the ternary operator is all done, where do we merge the two branches? So we're going to define the uh, where we merge the two branches as end if. So now we can go back in here and go, okay, if n is in fact greater than zero, what are we going to do? Well, we need to call P2 with n minus one. 
Well, n is still in register A, so we can just go ahead and decrement register A, so that A register A is register A is now n minus one. Then we push it on the stack. Okay, decrement D, put uh, store register A in whatever the stack point is pointing to. So this is for pushing n minus one on the stack, and then we do the call to P two. But wait. Um, don't we have that code already sitting somewhere? The answer is yes, because main has a call to p2, so we can just copy and paste it. So we'll copy and paste it from, let's see here, from line 43, 45 to line 49. So 45 to line 49, yank, which is copy. Go back to where I need to paste it, which is right here. Do a paste, and you can see how it is nice to be cop to just copy and paste, and not to have to worry about having the right label to define where the subroutine is supposed to return to. Because hey, it's gonna get it right regardless. So we already got the increment d over here, but there's one little thing that we have to do because you know, what we have at this point in register a on line 27 is the return value of p to n minus 1. But wait, Tech, you're supposed to multiply that by 2, and the toy processor has no multiplication instruction whatsoever. Ah, but 2 is easy, right? Because 2 is just, you know, adding a to a itself. So I just have to say add a a. That will double the value of register a, which has the return value of calling p2 with n minus 1 as the argument. So I'm all done. So by the time I get to line 27, the then value of the ternary expression is done. So that means I'm ready to go on to uh, p2 underscore and if, which is the merge point of the two branches of the ternary expression. So now I need to look at what about the else? Okay, we need to return a one. So you got a few choices here. Okay, so it's really kind of interesting, right? Because, you know, even with this, how many choices have we got? You can do the really obvious, which is LDIA with one, because one is the return value that we want, and be done with it. This is the most obvious way to get this done, but there's another way to do this. The other way to do this is increment A, because we know we get to this point because register A is zero, okay? If register A is not zero, we, we wouldn't be here to begin with. If register A is zero already, and the return value that has to be specified by register A needs to be one, then increment one, um, excuse me, increment A is gonna get the same thing done. So now the question is, which one is better? Well, um, it depends on what you are using to evaluate what is better. If you're looking at the from the perspective of efficiency, increment A is actually better. Because increment A does not need to go back to RAM to get that extra constant that it's only storing one and put it into the register. So it is a shorter instruction in terms of the number of bytes that we are using in RAM. But it also takes less time to execute because, because it doesn't need that extra uh, memory cycle to go back into RAM just to say, okay, what is the constant that I need to load into this register? So from the perspective of efficiency, increment A wins, okay? It wins in the number of bytes used by the instruction. It also wins in terms of how much time it takes in a real processor, okay? In a toy processor, it takes the same amount of time, but in a real processor with real memory, every access to memory is kind of slow. So, you know, increment A wins in, from that perspective. But from the readability perspective, increment A is not so easy to read. Because if I go to line 31, you know, let's say a week from today, and I ask, why are we incrementing A? Then I actually have to figure out where it came from. You know, it came from line 17. And right before line 17, we are um, ending A with A. And line 17 is a conditional branch that means you know, if A is zero, then we end up here. That means it, when we increment A, we end up with a value of one. That is convoluted, okay? So from the readability perspective, do this instead, okay? Because 
I know it doesn't, it's not the most efficient way of doing things, but guess what? It is much more readable. That few cycles, okay, that we are sa that, that we are shaving out of this, is not worth the trouble. Okay, so I think we are done. Yeah, but you can also see how when I write the program, how I, when I write the uh, write a subroutine, it is non-linear. Okay. I start with the shell, I start with the entry code, I start with the ex exit code right away, then I go back inside to create the framework of a conditional statement, which is kind of the same as a ternary operator. Then I go back in to fill in what I need to do for the then value, and then specify what I need to do for the else value. In other words, I'm using, I'm following the structure of the code from the outside in, when I write the code, I do not just write code in a sequential manner and just you know, go from line one to line two to line three and so on. Now, do you have to write your code this way? No, absolutely not. OK, I write code this way only because it works for me. Now, if it doesn't work for you, don't do it this way. Do it however it works for you. OK, so I have you know, done programming for Let's just say a long time. I'm not going to tell you guys how many years, but I can tell you it's in decades. Um, and I have just learned, you know, what kind of coding style works well for me and what does not work well for me. And I'm so I'm only doing it because this works for me. All right. So I think this program is all done and it's time to test it. So I will save the file first. And we'll first test the C code, because if the C code doesn't work, that means the logic of the program is problematic. Then we cannot expect the assembly code to work either. So let's deal with the, uh, the C code first. So we'll do a dash G to include debug information. I warn all, just in case I do something stupid that the compiler can catch. Um, and then we have P2.C to specify the source code and then dash o p2 to specify the executable, the name of the executable. And it gives me a single warning, which is fine because you know variable x uh, got a value, but we never bothered to look at the, um, we, we never bothered to use that value. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, I, I was chuckling because of a direct message. Uh, uh, OK, so let's go ahead and test the C code. OK, I, I personally just like GDB. OK, so we list the program. And particularly, we want to find out um, what goes on when this program executes. OK, so we're going to put a breakpoint on line three. You can also put a breakpoint at the entry point of a subroutine just by mentioning the name of the subroutine. So this is really kind of handy. So that, that's what we'll do. So we run the program. This is the first time we call P2. So we are already in P2. In this case, N is three. So we can expect it to call itself recursively. So when we continue execution, it will stop at the next breakpoint, which is also in P2. But this time N is two, because when we perform the recursion, you know, we, each time we are decreasing uh, N by one, <coughs> excuse me. Continue again, n is one, continue again, n is now finally zero. So what is happening here? This looks like a loop. Well, it is a kind of loop, okay? There are programming languages out there where there are no loops. There are no such, no such thing as a loop statement. So in those programming languages, the only thing you can do to have iterations is to have recursion. Um, one such programming language is called Lisp. So if you uh, look up Lisp, L-I-S-P, then you will find that that little weird language, okay, is um, does not have loops. Lisp is interesting in many other ways. It is also a strictly prefix type of programming language. So you know how we're using postfix notation in the assembler. Um, Lisp is a prefix only notation. So if you want to say, you know, one plus two, you have to say plus one, two. Um, so that's the other thing that's kind of interesting about Lisp. But getting onto this, getting back to this, 
So what we want to do first is to look at the backtrace. In other words, how did we get here? First of all, where's here? This is here, okay? Your frame zero is always referring to where we are at this point. But how did we get here? We got called from P2 on line five. How did we get there? It got called by P2 on line five. How do we get there? And so on. So eventually everything has to trace down to main because in C and C++, main is the entry point of you know, the execution of a program. But this also shows you how n has changed as we perform the recursion. It started off with a value of three, then two, then one, then zero. So if I were to single step here, so I'm single stepping each time going back backwards, but it's difficult to see what is really going on because I cannot set multiple breakpoints on the same line. So we cannot really see what is being returned and then get multiplied by two as a return value. And then we go back again and that particular return value in return is multiplied by two again, then it get returned again and so on <coughs> until we get back to main. Now, when we get back to main, we should see the psi effect of local variable X being uh, initialized to eight, which is the case. So this shows us the program does work. Okay, the, the logic of the program works because two to the power of three is in fact eight. Okay. So do we have any questions about the C code at this point? Before we go back and look at the assembly code and how that works. Are we good so far? So the C code is proven to work. Now we want to see if the assembly code is also going to work, but we also want to track down what is going on on the stack um, when the assembly code works. Okay, so let's so go ahead and do the usual thing. Okay, cap this to xclip cell clip. So now it, the program is in the clipboard. Switch back to the assembler. And we want to go back to the source tab. Get rid of the program that we just got in. Paste in the new program. Oh, we have an unresolved reference of N because I forgot to define it. Okay, all right, so let's fix that first. So nvim p2.ttpsm. And we just have to define N to be zero because um, no it is not the case <laughs> n is p2 local var size one plus because we have to skip the um, return address to get to the parameter because parameters got pushed first so they have higher addresses compared to the local variables they also they also have higher addresses compared to the return address itself. All right, so that should do it. Okay, and I go back here. And because the program is now one line longer than before, so just paste this line. I don't have to erase what I had earlier. And the assembler says everything is done. Go to the RAM file tab, make sure that there are no errors. Okay, that's good. And then we can download and we'll call this p2.csv then we go back to the commit line and just run the program again but this time it is p2 like so and we're done here go back to the trace analyzer and we import the t uh, the tsv file the trace file there we go all right and this is a pretty short trace so we go to analysis. First thing first, did the program work? Did we store an eight to location FF? Okay, so that's the first question. 
So let's go all the way to the end. And see what is being stored. And yes, so we did store 8 into location FF, which is great. And then the second thing is, was the stack pointer balanced? In other words, whatever value it started off with, which is 0, 0, should be the, uh, the value of the stack pointer when we finish the program. The answer is yes as well. This is cool, okay? So the program does work. It's not so cool from the perspective that I could not demonstrate any type of technique for debugging, um, but the program does work. All right, so in between, what is going on, okay? So instead of just trying to read all of this stuff here to find out what is going on, you know, when the program is uh, was running, it's probably a good idea to try to figure this out on a piece of paper first. Or if you prefer, we can use a spreadsheet just like what we did yesterday. So we can do it the same way with yesterday. So we can now say, okay, here's location FF, FE, FD, FC, FB, FA, and let's see, I think we need a little bit more locations this time. F9, F8, and I think that's that's enough. There we go. So the, the job of FF is it is um, local variable X of main, um, and then FE is what, what we use to push uh, the argument when we call P2 the first time which is 3, and this is the return address to main, and this is where, this is uh, the, the place where we push 2, which is the argument to P2 again in the recursive call inside P2, and this is you know, where we return to P2, and this is the 1, this is return to whoops, P2, and finally we have a 0, and this is returned to P2. So according to what I think the program should do, the last location on the stack we should use is F7. Okay, so now we can go to the trace analyzer and and basically you know search and find out you know whether that really is the case. So you can kind of scan that you can see that the stack pointer is now on the increase. So we have a little bit more space to go back to. And here is uh, D is now D uh, F7, and it just decreased to F7. So that means you know we have to be storing something over there, and we store location 18 to uh, memory location F7. So now the question is, is that really the return address to back to P2? Okay. To answer that question, we go to the assembler, and we go to the assemble tab. And we go to P2 <clears throat> right after the recursive call. This is where we load the return address. And you can see the return address is in fact a 18. And you can also see you know, how location 18 really is corresponding to the instruction that we should get back to when the subroutine is all done. So this is kind of a really kind of quick check to, to make sure that the program works, I mean the subroutine works the way it's supposed to. So do we have any questions about um, this recursive implementation? And I think, you know, for those people who have taken um, a data structure class where you have encountered uh, countless uh, recursive subroutines, knowing you know, how the stack is organized in a recursive call, I'm hoping this helps to clarify uh, concepts that you have previously learned but not quite understanding how it is implemented. This is how it's implemented. Every single invocation has its frame. The first call to P2 has these two bytes as its frame. The second call has these two bytes as its frame. The third call has these two bytes as its frame. And then the last one has these two bytes as its frame. And this is also why you see in backtrace, you know, those are basically frames. Um, it's just that in GDB, everything is well organized and they tell you exactly what is going on. But we can kind of do the same thing manually using a spreadsheet as a table so that we can have a visual idea 
of you know how the stack is being used and what frames really are in in this context <clears throat> so are we okay with the power of two sample program because if we are then we can move on to the second program we are good okay all right so let's move on to the second program so let's switch back here so the second program is about what do we need to do when we want to compute the sum of two of the return values of two subroutines okay so we want to check this out um, so I'm always kind of looking for names for this kind of program so we'll say um, I'll call this sum okay sum.c so we have dash uppercase O sum.c and then sum.ttpasm so we'll deal with the C code first pound include std int dot h <clears throat> and we'll define some kind of you know not so useful functions the first one I'll call it Johnny which has no parameters and all it does is return the value of 5 so this is referring to um, Johnny 5 the robot from short circuit the movie um, yeah I, I think just mentioning that movie is dating myself you know because uh, most of you probably do not know which movie we are talking about the second one we'll call it um, Ryan which in this case is an, is a last name and we'll be turning seven so I cannot remember her first name uh, but last name is Ryan she is the actress of seven of nine of uh, deep no uh, of Voyager that's it all right so now Jerry Ryan okay that's it thank you and she's also in the um, the latest um, Star Trek short series you know called Picard it's kind of okay you know I'm not too excited about that movie I mean short series watched it already not too impressed all right so now we define 12 okay and you guys would say oh you're gonna return 12 as a numerical value no we are gonna return Johnny plus Brian this is kind of an interesting one I never thought of it this way but it just occurred to me this is one of those things you know that happens in my head in my in my mind is you know what if these two becomes a couple one is a real robot and the other one is a Borg or an ex Borg or XB from that movie that would be kind of an interesting thing hmm. okay all right so now we have local variable x in main and main is the result of calling 12 return 0 okay so this is the program that I want to implement in assembly but before we do that okay we'll go ahead and compile the C code first and make sure that we are in fact storing 12 in local variable x in main so we do a gcc g wall um, sum.c sum dash o dot sum. There we go. And then gdb sum. Put a breakpoint on line 23. Run the whole program. Print x. x is indeed 12. So it does work. Cool. So now the question is what do we do to implement? The assembly side. So the assembly side once again starts with a no op, and if you want to remind yourself that the stack starts at the stack pointer starts at location zero zero, that's fine. No, not a problem. Unconditional branch to main because we want to follow the order of the definitions of the subroutine. So we first have Johnny, which is pretty easy because LDI A five. And then we have a LDBD increment D um, 
and JMPB. That's it for Johnny. Then we have Ryan. Kind of the same deal, you know, except it is a seven here. LD, BD, increment D, and JMPB, and we are done here. So now we have 12. And you can see all of these subroutines do not have any um, parameters. So this sample program is all about what we need to do here. So we need, we need to call uh, the subroutine called Johnny. Now that should be pretty easy to do now. Okay, because we have that template, decrement D first, LDIA with dot five plus, <clears throat> STDA, and a JMPI to the subroutine that we want to call, which is Johnny in this case. So that means when Johnny is done, we're going to return to where the cursor is at this point, okay, basically here. Let me make it very obvious, here, okay. Now we have to call Ryan, right? So calling Ryan is about the same, decrement D, LDI, A.5+, and I think most of you are already thinking, um, Tech, we got a problem here. Well, we got a problem because um, when we are right here, okay, when we are on this instruction, register A has the return value from calling Johnny, okay? But the moment we do something like this, um, it's going to destroy that return value, okay? So how are we going to fix this problem? Somebody is going to say, well, don't use register A, okay? Use register B. Oops, B, register B, and so on. Well, that only delays the inevitable because Ryan, calling Ryan, is going to also use register A as the return value of seven this time. And also you can see over here. So you cannot avoid register A being overwritten because every subroutine that is returning a scalar wants to use register A. Okay, then somebody is going to say, but tech, you got an extra, you know, register called register C. Why not save it into register C first, okay, doing a CPR like this. Then we can just go ahead and add <coughs> register uh, C to register A, and we are all done with 12 in this case. Okay, let me just kind of finish the exit code first because I don't want to forget to do it. Um, but there's a problem with this approach. It appears to work, but it doesn't work in general. It doesn't work in general because the caller can never really know what registers are being used by the subroutine that is calling. So in the toy processor, the standard or the agreement between the caller and the callee is the callee can use any or all of the other registers. So except for register D, which has a special purpose, register A, B, or C can all be overwritten or modified by a subroutine. So that means this instruction here, CPRCA, is not going to work in general. Now, is it going to work with this program as it is now? The answer is yes, it does. Okay, But I can make a very simple change without breaking the agreement between um, the caller and the callee, and now it doesn't work. Because nobody says that I have to use register B in when we are uh, returning to the caller. So Ryan, you know, the subroutine Ryan can decide, I don't want to use register B, you know, I want to use register C. It's perfectly okay. So now the program doesn't work. So that means now we have a little bit of an issue, which is basically, um, so where are we going to stash that um, value of register A when we need to use it later on? So what do you guys think? What is the safest place you can save something that cannot be touched by a by other subroutines? Memory. Okay, very good. So Richard is is correct. Okay, memory is the correct. And to be more specific, Catherine is correct too. 
it is on the stack. We just have to push it on the stack. Okay. So now we go here. We say, well, we need to push register A on the stack. Pushing something on the stack is just decrementing the stack pointer and store that something onto the stack. So now we have pushed the return value of Johnny on the stack and we are now free to call the subroutine Ryan because hey, no th nothing can modify what I have just pushed on the stack now. Now the question is when we get back from Ryan at this point, now register A has the return value of calling Ryan. That sounds like the name of another movie. Now the question is, how do we get back that value that we saved earlier on the stack? Well, we have to, yep, I'm going to wait until Catherine finished typing. Does the new decrement D affect the call to Ryan? Hmm, that is a very good question. It does not in this case, because Ryan does not need to, does not have any um, parameters and does not involve you know, using any um, anything that is in the frame right now. But you are correct because we are changing the stack pointer. So if I need to access anything that is on the frame, now the offsets are all wrong. Okay, if I had offsets to items on the frame, then every single offset is now off by one byte because the stack pointer has now decreased by one compared to the assumption that I'm making at the beginning of the subroutine. If it did have parameters, yes, that would be, it would be a problem, but nothing that we cannot solve. So we'll work with this one first and then we'll talk about that one. Okay. So uh, JMPI to Ryan and uh, when Ryan returns, so what we need to do at this point is to LD, okay, which is the opposite of ST. We, this time we have to put it into different register. Let's say register B and increment D. So these two instructions, if you remember from the stack discussion, is popping um, a value from the stack into register B in this case. So now all we have to do is add AB because B is the return value of calling Johnny. A is the return value of calling Ryan. And I just have to add these two and store the result back into A so that that register A becomes the return value of 12. Then we go through the normal sequence of returning from this subroutine back to main. So here's main, you know, and I'm not going to go through the uh, trouble to uh, do all the allocation stuff. So I'm just going to do the shorthand this time. All right, so we need to call 12 first. Okay, what if, okay, Richard is asking, what if Ryan alters register A before add AB? Ryan always alters register A because it has to use register A to return the constant of seven. But register B is retrieved after we get back from calling Ryan. So Ryan cannot possibly influence the value of register B at this point. Yes, so we, we are basically retrieving what we pushed after calling Johnny, but before we called Ryan. All right, so back to main, we just have to call 12. Okay, so this one is easy. Uh, document D, LDI A dot five plus, <clears throat> ST D A, JMPI to 12. And when it comes back, we have to compute the address of X. So we have a LDI uh, BX. We cannot use register A anymore because register A has the return value of 12. Add BD STBA. And that's it. Okay, so we are now done with this program. Let's go ahead and see if um, it works or not. Okay, so we're going to do the cat sum to x clip cell clip <clears throat> and then go back to the assembler 
So I might have to go over time just a little bit today because you know the the subroutine that we have right now, you know, is is good, okay? But it doesn't have any parameters. So the question is what if it has parameters? So we'll go ahead and modify the program just a little bit to talk about that. Okay, so we go to the RAM file, download it. And then run it in CLI mode. Okay, and go back to the trace analyzer. A program like this, you know, you can actually uh, see that it's working correctly without using the trace analyzer. But it's probably a good idea to kind of get used to using the trace analyzer because the program that you're going to write over the weekend um, is going to be a little bit more involved when it comes to debugging it and the trace analyzer can be extremely helpful in this case so so I'm just going through this multiple times so that hopefully you guys can uh, do this you know using the trace analyzer when you're doing your own programming all right so we'll go ahead and just kind of cheat a little bit go back to go all the way to the end and see whether location ff is getting 12 and the answer is yes the stack pointer is balanced okay so everything works so now the question is where is that byte that we saved on the stack well, where should it be? Now we know FF is local variable X of main. FE is the return address back to main. And then FD is going to be first used as the return address back to 12. But then later on, it is used as the uh, location where we saved the first call, which is the call to Johnny. So it's going to be FD that we saved that five. So we can now look it up and we confirm that. So location FD was used to save the uh, return value of the first call, which is to Johnny. And this is the return address when we set up the second call to Ryan. This is the return address back to 12 right before we um, uh, continue execution in the subroutine called Ryan. So all of these things are fully explained, you know, why we store certain things on the stack. So now, this is the basically the end of the lecture, almost the end, is I'm going to make some changes to the program called SUM. And we are going to make the subroutine 12 to take a single argument uh, parameter. So in 8 underscore T, we'll call it N again. And then the subroutine n, I mean Ryan, is going to take um, one parameter as well. And here is n. And we just want to return 7 plus n. Okay. So very small modification to the program. But in terms of the assembly code, okay, we have to make some changes because now we got parameter n sitting on the stack. Here's my return address, which is also on the stack. And initially, the stack pointer is pointing here. Okay, So if I want to return the correct value, I cannot just say you know, LDIA with 7. We have to first get back to the value of n and then add 7 to it. Okay, So we define n to be 1. Okay, So I'm you know, shortcutting the whole thing. A little bit because you know that's at the offset of one from where the stack point is pointing to so we do LDI um, a with n add uh, the stack pointer to a so a is now the address of n um, LD AA so the a is now the value of parameter n then we have to add 7 to it you can increment 7 times but I think the other way is a little bit faster which is really just you know uh, load 7 into another register and then add AB 
So that's the modification to Ryan. And then the modification to 12 is going to be about the same. We got n, we got the return address. And this is where things get a little bit interesting because I cannot redefine the label n to be 1. So I got two choices here. I can either um, make it a unique label, which is, you know, this is n of 12, okay? Or we can also, you know, just reuse this n which was defined in Ryan. I'm going to use the, the first approach, okay? So 12 underscore n is 1 because it is also one byte passed where the stack point is pointing to. Um, let's see. Right. Okay, so this is fine. We don't need n when we are calling Johnny. So the call to Johnny is unmodified. But when we call Ryan, we have to push n on the stack first, right? So normally, this is what we do. So normally, we say LDI. Um, we can use A again because we have already pushed the return value on the stack using decrement D and STDA. So A is really available at this point for whatever purpose I want to use it for. So we say LDIA with 12N. Oops. Add AD. So the A is now the address of N in 12. So we do LDAA and then we decrement D and then we do STDA. So normally this is going to push you know, a parameter N of 12 on the stack. But we have a problem because because of this particular decrement instruction, uh, the original offset of one byte past where the stack point is pointing to is no longer true. Because what the stack looks like at this point is we still got N as a parameter pushed by the caller. We still have the return address pushed by the caller. But this time we have the return value of calling Johnny sitting here and the stack pointer is pointing here. So that means the offset that we have originally calculated, which is one bypass, is no longer true. So the question now is, um, so how do we get back to parameter n of 12? So what do you guys think? What, what do you think? How do, how do we get back to n? And we want kind of the minimum modification of this code. The problem is because we have decremented the stack pointer. So the distance between where the stack pointer points to and the item that I want to retrieve is now longer. How much longer? It's longer by one byte. So that means I only have to add one to the offset. That will do it. Okay, Catherine is typing something. We'll wait for that. Yep, exactly. So 12n1 plus is going to fix this particular problem. So we'll do some changes to the C code as well, because when we call 12, we have to supply an additional parameter. Uh, so we'll give it an argument of three in this case, and we'll mirror that change in the assembly code. So in the assembly code in main, when we call 12, we have to call 12 with, a, with an argument of three. So we'll do it over here, LDIA with three, decrement D, STDA. So now we are pushing three before we call 12. And when 12 returns, we have to deallocate that argument. So increment D is needed here. And I also need it you know, um, back in 12. So we also need it over here, increment D, to deallocate um, the argument. All right. So let's go ahead and check out this program to see whether it works. Okay. So we'll do an XA to save all. And we'll do it in C code first. So we compile the C code, GDB to C code. Put a breakpoint on line 23, run it. So now we have to think about what the result should be because we have 5 plus 7, 
also plus the 3, so it's going to be 15. So print x, it is indeed 15, so that's good. So the C code tells us you know, that you know, um, what I think the program should do is correct. So now we want to try the assembly code. There we go. Switch back to the assembler. And just paste because the program has just gotten a little bit longer, so it's going to use up some additional cells. You know, it's not going to be a problem. And go to RAM file. And I'm overwriting the original CSV file. And then we go back to the command line way of running Logisim. And then switch back to the trace analyzer. And we have sum.tsv. Replace tab no all right and we go back to analysis and this is all done and now the five is still here okay that is still correct um, And then we got the extra three. Okay, this is the three that we use to push to um, to call Ryan. This is the argument to uh, when we call Ryan. And this is the return address. Um, when Ryan is done, you know, this is where it's, where the program is supposed to be turned to. Two eight seems a little bit far and when it is all done uh oh let's see is the program correct hmm okay so let me check a few things first go to the assemble tab Okay, the halt instruction is at location four zero. And the last opcode is at location three F. Location three F is the increment D instruction. And the stack pointer. Okay, so we have a problem. Woohoo! Yes, this is good. <clears throat> so we have a problem, the program doesn't work. Now we do know that it works up to a certain point. Okay, so we know that it works at least up to this point. In other words, when um, hmm, the interesting thing is at it's ex at exactly the same place. But let's go ahead and trace it from this point. We um, this is where we saved um, the return value from calling Johnny. And then after that, we need to say we, this is where we saved it on the stack. Then we set up to call Ryan, and that's by pushing three zero three on the stack first. And then we call Ryan, and this is the return address. When Ryan is done, this is where it needs to return to in twelve. So let's check that we are in fact specifying the correct return address. So we go to the assemble tab. And then we look up location 28, and then we ask, is this where Ryan is supposed to return to? The answer is yes. Okay, this is in fact the right place for the subroutine Ryan to return to. So the trace is correct up to this point. <clears throat> so we want to continue to look at this until we get back to location 28, or see whether we got back to location 28. So we did get back to location 28. 
And now the question is, what do we put into register A when we do that? So register A has a value of 0A, which is 7 plus 3, and that is in fact correct. All right, so that's good so far. And the stack pointer changed from FA back to FB to deallocate the return address. So the trace is also you know, correct up to this point, up to row 190. Everything is still good. At that point, I deallocate the, um, the, the argument that is sitting on the stack. So the stack pointer goes back to location FC. And location FC does have the um, saved return value from calling Johnny. And that's why register B got a 5. That is correct as well. And then we deallocate that byte on the stack. In other words, the byte that we used to save the return value of calling Johnny is now deallocated. The stack pointer goes back to location FD. Um, then we compute the sum between um, the two return values. So we have 5, and then we have, uh, what's the other one? 5 and 10 which is uh, 15 and 0F is correct. That is 15 in decimal. <clears throat> and then we retrieve the return address back to main, which is 3A. So now we need to double check to make sure that 3A is the correct place to return to in main. So we look up main, we look up the, the call. This is where the 3A is coming from. The question is, is it really the place where we need, we need to go back to? The answer is yes, it is the correct place to go back to. Okay, so the trace is correct up to this point. Um, all right, so we continue execution. And then we end up at location 3A. It deallocates um, the byte that was used as an argument to 12. So the stack pointer goes back to FF. <clears throat> And this is for uh, computing the address of X. So eventually it is computed to be FF. And then we store the 15 into location FF, which is local variable X. Oh, okay, it is correct. I didn't see the four zero earlier. So everything works out. Huh. I wonder why I missed the last portion of this trace because I didn't see this part. I only saw that it returned back to 3F. Maybe I just forgot to scroll up. Okay, my bad, operator error. <laughs> this is one of those things where, you know, go like, well, the program didn't work. No, it actually did. Cool. So the technique that I'm talking about here that you are gonna need is, okay, let me just go back to the source code first. So the technique that you need to use is to save the return value from an earlier call to a subroutine on the stack if you need to call another subroutine later on. But by doing that, the offset to everything in the frame of this particular invocation will be off by one. So you need to account for that plus one. And the way you account for that plus one is to add one to the label that is representing the original offset. You just have to say, well, that was before we pushed that extra thing on the stack. So the distance from where the stack point is pointing to back to that particular thing that is on the frame is now one more than what it used to be. And that's what the one plus is about here. All right, so that's the end of today's lecture. Do I have any questions I can answer right away? Let me just kind of wait a, about 15 seconds because that's the lag time to YouTube. And this is why teaching remotely or online is a little bit less efficient is because of the, all the lag time involved. All right, so 15 seconds has passed. I'm not seeing anything. All right, so I'm going to stop the um, live stream at this point. I will come back in about 10 minutes and answer questions related to what we have talked about today or anything. All right.
And if I don't talk to you guys again, have a nice weekend. Don't forget the homework. Oh, you also need to know the uh, the passcode of the lab. Passcode of the lab is Fib for Fibonacci. There we go. Cool. So let me pin that. All right. So my suggestion is to take a look at the two programs that I worked on today, particularly the second one, and make sure that you understand the whole thing or, and also start to document the whole thing. Um, do all of this before you even start on your homework, because you know if you don't fully understand these two programs that I have just talked about today, you probably won't have enough knowledge to get started with the program. All right, so with that said, I'm going to get out of um, live stream on both uh, Discord and